Book of Deuteronomy, chapter 14. Chapter 14. Again, Father, we come before you asking that you would bless this time in your word. Bless, Lord, the teaching and proclamation of truth from these pages. Pray, Father, that you would sharpen our ears, tune our hearts to hear you, to listen to you. God, speak to us in ways that only you can. Lord, I pray that uh, I wouldn't get in the way tonight, but that this would just be your word pouring over us. I pray that you would bless all of us, Father, as we study, Lord, to love you more. And, Father, to love each other more. So, Holy Spirit, come do your work among us and teach us now. In the precious name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Well, the first two verses of chapter 14 probably should be part of chapter 13 because they continue on with the thinking that we've covered in the last two weeks of chapters 12 and 13. Talking about paganism and false religion and staying away from it and watching out for it and not yielding to it or listening to it. Our eyes not pitying those who try to bring it to us or sparing or concealing those who would, who would bring a gospel other than that which we've already been given, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And these first two verses, again, I, I, if I were putting this together, and again, this is, this is no skin off of God's nose, because he didn't put the verse markers in there. We did that. So uh, I think these first two verses would belong back in the previous chapter. Read these, follow along with me. You are the sons of the Lord your God. And Moses says, you shall not cut yourselves nor shave your forehead for the sake of the dead. You are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It says, you shall not cut yourselves nor shave your foreheads. Now, my daughter probably would have done well to read that back after, I believe it was, we had just moved up here. It's about seven years ago now, and she had a little knot in her hair. Hannah was seven years old. She went to her room, took out a pair of scissors. She took care of that knot. She took care of most of the hair on the top of her head. At that time, she had the funkiest haircut and hairdo for about five years. I mean, literally, she had this seven-year-old with a comb over. It was hilarious. It was the only way we could do it because this was literally, she just kept cutting and cutting until she had a little shave spot right here. Real long here, long here, shaved here. I wish she had read this passage. Don't shave your forehead. But what's going on here as we look at these, he says, don't cut yourselves or shave your forehead for the sake of the dead. Simply put, what this is about, Moses is saying, don't even look like the pagan world around you, for these were pagan practices. Don't even look like them. Don't have the appearance of them. Don't do things that would be similar to what they do. You're a chosen people. And the truth is, the chosen people look different. That's just the way it is. You want to be a chosen person of God, you should and will look different than the world. And we've talked a lot about this, that we're not to be encouraging each other to fit in, to be, you know, covert. We are to be who we are in Christ Jesus. To wear, as it were, Jesus on our sleeve. To be real. This is is who I am. I am a chosen child of God. I have chosen to be His child. He chose me to be His child. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I want people to know that. It's who I am. And I don't want to hide that away. Chosen people look different. Now this was a a pagan practice here, the shaving of the forehead, the cutting of themselves. Jeremiah 16, verse 6, among many other verses in the Old Testament, explain this. Jeremiah writes, both great men and small will die in this land. They will not be buried, they will not be lamented, nor will anyone gash himself or shave his head for them. Now we don't know historically exactly what this meant, or how it was practiced, or why it was practiced, but we know it was pagan in origin, but it had something to do with pagan rituals, this cutting of themselves and gashing themselves. You you might remember on Mount Carmel, Elijah was there and all the prophets of Baal in that just absolutely wonderful story about how Elijah in his wonderful confidence in the Lord 
is having a lot of fun with these prophets of Baal. 400 prophets of Baal, and what does it say that they're doing? They are working themselves up into a frenzy, trying to get their God to burn the altar that they've built, trying to get their God to send fire from heaven for the sacrifice, and they're doing everything they can do, and it says they were literally cutting themselves, letting their own blood pour out on this altar to try and get the attention of Baal. I love what Elijah does in that, in that story. He says, maybe your God's asleep. You know, maybe Baal's taking a nap. Maybe he's indisposed. <laughs> Literally, maybe he's using the restroom. I mean, it's really funny. Elijah's having a great time. And of course, you know the end of the story. Elijah prays to God after dousing and drenching the whole thing. And God sends fire from heaven. But we have seen this being practiced, this idea of cutting yourself as a pagan ritual. Or, or shaving yourself. We don't know exactly why, but we know from passages like these that it had to do with rituals for the dead. Well, Paul had something to say about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you want to flip there, you can. I'm going to read it real quickly to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 22. Paul's writing here and he says, For since by a man came death... By a man also came the resurrection of the dead. He says, as in Adam, all die. So also in Christ, all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and after that, those who are Christ at his coming. And then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, to, to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and authority and power. Paul writes, he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. In verse 28, Paul says, when all things are subjected to him... When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. And listen to verse 29. Otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are they baptized for them? And this was a practice that began going on. People began thinking, well, so-and-so has already died, so maybe I can be baptized for them. And, and Paul explains in this place and in other places that that's a denial of grace. And this is the whole point. In fact, it's not our baptism that saves us in the first place. You understand it's God's grace. It's faith in God's grace. My baptism being that outward expression of obedience. Jesus asked, it to, asked us to do it. We do it. But it's not that act that saves us. And what was it that Jesus had to say about the dead? Matthew 8, 22, Jesus said, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Which might seem like a harsh statement. Except Jesus is saying, you know, don't let those who have died keep you from faith in me. Do you know anybody that's done that? I can't believe in a God who would send my old Aunt Bessie, who died 10 years ago, to hell. Jesus would say, let the dead bury their own dead. You follow me. Don't look for excuses. Don't focus on those who have already gone. Jesus also said in Matthew 22, verse 31, He said, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then Jesus says, He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Which is interesting, because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were dead. At least, that's what we thought. Jesus says God's not the God of the dead. When he calls himself the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, what does that imply? That Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are living, are still alive, are awaiting that time when they could be caught up to be with the Lord eternally. God is not the God of the dead. The point of all this is, is simply this. The pagan world is a dead world. In fact, any life outside of Christ is a life of death and decay. That's the choice we have. Live in Christ and have a spirit that is being renewed daily, Paul says, or live outside of Christ and live in decay. That's the choice. And who wants that? Man, in Jesus, we are born into new life, life eternal, which is why the Christian response to death can and should be different. I would ask you to pray. There's a, a friend of, of Hannah's um, who comes with her and is involved here at the bridge. And, and we know her, her mom and her dad. Well, her dad just died yesterday of cancer. 
And this has been a long struggle. and been going on for a long time. They knew it was coming, and he'd been slowly slipping away over the last week or so. Um, and I was just thinking about this, and it's, it's a tragedy, and it's, it's difficult, and as Christians, when we lose people that we're close to, it hurts. But Paul says, 1 Thessalonians 4.13, We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. It's a done deal. He says, we say this to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. And Paul says, so therefore comfort each other with these words. Remind each other of this good news. This friend of Hannah's, her dad, is in Christ. Her mom, though devastated right now, will see him again in that day. Paul says these are the best words of comfort that could be brought. God is a God of the living, not a God of the dead. So Moses says, avoid the dead things. Avoid the things of the pagans, which will not get you life, but will only lead to death. Now, moving on from the warnings against paganism, he kind of closes out that section of, the, of his teaching of Moses, you know, reapplying the law to the people. And he moves on now in a different direction. He begins to get back to the application of the law, the perfect law, to show the Israelites how, as a chosen people, they can live and be different. And we'll pick that up now in verse 3. Going on to the law about clean and unclean animals, Moses says, you shall not eat any detestable thing. Any detestable thing. Now, it's interesting, Moses here is going to repeat dietary laws for Israel. We studied these, we looked at these very closely in previous studies and previous books in the Torah. Kosher laws, dietary rules, regulations that serve the Jewish people very well. Not just in Moses' time, not just when they came into the Promised Land, but across history. What you and I are, are used to hearing is called kosher has done very well by the Jewish people. In the time of the Black Plague in Europe, in fact, many of the different plagues that hit Europe, the Jews often were blamed and persecuted for those plagues. Why? Because they weren't dying like the Gentiles were. Because they knew something the Gentiles didn't know. They were just living by God's law, His prescription for healthy living, literally. God was saying, you don't eat these things, and you do eat these things, and if you stick to this, you're going to be all right. And the Jewish people did and have, and have continued to be healthy because of it. God knew what he was doing. In contrast to that, (laughs) these sanitary and dietary laws, which were medically and physiologically right on target, all the way back in Moses' time, you can look back in Moses' time at some of the other cultures and what they were saying about medicine and compare the two. It's very interesting. Let me give you something. This is from 1552 B.C. I think I've shared this before, but it's the Etours Papyrus. It's actually been discovered. It's an Egyptian document contemporary to the time of Moses. And in the Etours Papyrus, they found these prescriptions for medical situations. I'll read these to, to you. To prevent gray hair. Some of you with gray hair, you may want to pay attention to this. Larry, you might. This is a good one for you, okay? What you want to do... At least you have here. Okay. What you want to do, mix the blood of a black calf with the fat of a rattlesnake and eat it twice daily. Okay. This will help the gray hair thing, according to the Egyptians in 1552. While, while God's saying, uh, don't eat detestable things, or the animals you may eat and not eat, don't eat these things, eat these things, and you'll be okay. The Egyptians are going, yeah, mix this up. Here's another one. To reverse baldness. Mix the fats of a horse, a hippo, a cat, a crocodile, a snake, and an ibex, and eat it. And if the baldness is severe, add a tooth of a donkey cooked in honey. Mm. Now, see, this is the medical prescription of Egypt in the day. Well, Moses is giving a prescription that if you follow it today is healthy. Another proof that the Bible is beyond that of man, that that the medical science, we're just starting now to catch up with some of the things that God said 3,500 years ago, this is the way to eat and be healthy, and this is what he's doing with the Jewish people. 
Moses, it's incredible. He was medically correct. His prescription, God's prescription, beneficial. Man slowly has begun to figure that out. Truly, Psalm 19.8 is right. The precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They're righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, even on a donkey's tooth, and the drippings of a honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. There's even great health. It's interesting to me. And Jesus comes along, and it's recorded in Mark chapter 7. He said the real issue is not physical food anyway. That's not the point. The point of these dietary regulations, it, Jesus says, it's not what you put in. It's not what you take into your mouth. Is, that just goes through the digestive tract and on out, and it's not that big a deal. What, what really matters is what you put in the heart, the deeper place of the soul and the spirit. It's what you take in there. In fact, let me read this to you. Mark chapter 7. Jesus is speaking about these things, and in verse 14, he says, it says, After he called the crowd to himself, he began to say to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand that there is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he had left the crowd and entered his house, the disciples questioned him, began to wonder what he's talking about down here in this. And down in verse 18 it says, He said to them, Are you so lacking in understanding? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it doesn't go into his heart. It goes into his stomach and is eliminated. And Mark writes, Thus he declared all foods clean. But he was saying that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. So from within, out of the heart of men... Proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting, and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride. And if you're not in any of those categories, the last one might get you foolishness. Okay? <laughs> That's where I get hammered, right there. Verse 23, he says, All these evil things proceed from within, and they defile the man. And in the big debate that's raised over whether the nature of man is good, evil, or indifferent, where do you think Jesus falls? He would say the nature of man is evil, inherently evil, which is why we need a Savior so desperately that out of the heart of man proceed all of these evil things. And that's the context now, and I read that because I want you to understand that Moses' teaching, we can see looking back through the context of Jesus' teaching. Jesus is saying it's really not about the foods, but it's about what they indicate, and you can learn from this if you read it with that in mind. Back to Deuteronomy back chapter 14, verse 4. These are the animals which you may eat. It says the ox, and the sheep, and the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roebuck, and the sears. Sorry, the wild goat, the ibex, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. Any animal that divides the hoof and has the hoof split in two and chews the cud among the animals that you may eat. Nevertheless, he says, you are not to eat of these among those which chew the cud or among those that divide the hoof in two, the camel and the rabbit and the shapen, for although they chew the cud, they don't divide the hoof. They're unclean for you. The pig, because it divides the hoof, but it does not chew the cud, it is unclean for you. You shall not eat any of their flesh, nor touch their carcasses. Two regulations. Very simple regulations Moses gives, God gives, for the people when it comes to what kind of animals they can eat. Very simple. Animals who have a divided hoof and who chew the cud are okay for you. Pretty easy to remember. How does that apply to us spiritually? I was on a mission trip with, with some kids in Honduras, and uh, the food that they were cooking us was rather unique from night to night. And one night we went in there and there was very fresh meat. And there weren't any cows around, and we knew the meat hadn't been brought in, but we also knew that there had been a donkey on the premises that was no longer there. Yeah. So what I did was walk up behind one of the 
high school girls as we stood in line for this food, and we're not sure what this meat is, but we're kind of taking it out of politeness. And she put, she, she was saying, and right in front of me, I could hear her going, oh, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can do this. And I just walked up behind her, and as soon as the meat was put on her plate, I just went, <laughs> <laughs> Two regulations determine whether the meat is kosher, the hoof and the cud. A divided hoof, which, listen to this, has to do with how the animal walks how the animal walks. And the cud, carefully chewed and digested food, having to do with how the animal ate. What does that have to do with us? Listen, to determine what is clean and unclean in my spirit, I can apply the same principle. Apply it this way. How does that animal walk? How do the producers of that movie, how do these musicians, how does that author, that news reporter, how do they walk in their life? Because how they walk is going to impact what they're putting out there that we're taking in. How do they walk? Is there a division in the hoof? In other words, do they know right from wrong? Are they clear about those things? Or is it just one big fat gray area hoof that's kind of into everything? How do they walk? When we take these things in, that's important. So how often do you go see a movie and you have no idea what the writer of the movie really believes? Most of the time, right? How many of us really sit down and go, I wonder what, where this guy is in his personal life. He could be a homosexual pedophile, and we're sitting there going, what a lovely movie. And you've got to know there is agenda in those things. We don't do things just to do them. There's agenda. How do they walk? How does the animal chew? Is what's being presented thoroughly researched? Is it considered? Is it well digested? Is it refined? Has it been processed and, and has the person taken time with it? I mean, scientific research is often touted as authoritative in our world. If, hey, if it's in a scientific journal, it's authoritative, even though it might only be one study. And there could be all kinds of problems with the variables in that study, but you wouldn't know that. The news just comes on and says, science has now shown us this. Blah. And how many times have they gone back and forth? Bacon's good for you, bacon's bad for you. You should never have bacon, you should eat bacon. I mean, you know, it's, it, eggs are great. No, you eat the whites. Don't eat the whites. Eat the yolks. No, you better not eat the yolks. And we're sitting there going, I can't even have breakfast anymore. <laughs> Science doesn't have a clue. Every time we think we've figured out one thing, it's on to something else. Great diets that will save a person's life, we find out two years later, no, that'll kill you. <laughs> Has it been processed and worked out? This is why, by the way, I keep coming back to Scripture. Because it's worked out. Because even as we just talked about 3,500 years ago, it was medically correct. It was accurate back then. How much more so now in our world? I can count on this. If I need some advice in my life, I have a place I can go where I can read and study and go, Oh, that makes sense. Okay, I can live by that. It clearly delineates right and wrong. It's digestible and processed and proven over time. In fact, in delineating right from wrong, the Hebrew writer goes so far as to say that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it's piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of of the heart. This is what the Word can do, but no document produced by man, whether scientific or not, no document produced by man can do what this Word does. And that's why we can lean so, so clearly on the Word. So then Moses goes on now to fish and to birds. Verse 9, he says, These you may eat of all that are in water. Anything that has fins and scales you may eat, but anything that does not have fins and scales you shall not eat. It is unclean for you. In, in previous days, you talked about the things without fins and scales tended to be bottom dwellers, mud dwelling creatures, unhealthy and dangerous, but not the things with the fins and the scales. Then he says, with birds, verse 11, you may eat of any clean bird, but these are the ones which you shall not eat. The eagle, and the vulture, and the buzzard, and the red kite, and a blue kite when I was a kid, the falcon, and the kite in their kinds, and every raven in its kind, even the ostrich, the owl, the seagull. <laughs> Seagulls will eat anything. If you're just trying to feed, they will eat, and they'll eat a radio if you put it in front of them. Those things are bizarre. Where was I? <laughs> Woo! Uh, the seagull was, what verse? Fifteen. Good, yes. And the hawk. 
in their kind. The little owl and the gray owl, the environmentalists wouldn't appreciate that verse. You could, uh, well, no, I guess they would appreciate it. You can't eat the little owl or the great owl or the white owl. The spotted owl. The pelican, the carrion vulture, and the cormorant, the stork and the heron and their kind, and the, I used to know how to pronounce this. Remember how to pronounce this one, Russ? The hoopoe? The hoopoe and the bat. So you're off the hook, those of you who are bat lovers. And all the teeming life with wings are unclean to you. They shall not be eaten. Verse 20, you may eat any clean bird. 21, you shall not eat anything that dies of itself. In other words, roadkill is out. You may give it to the alien who's in your town. <laughs> they can have it. So that he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner. <laughs> No, no, it's, it's okay, really. I just hit it with my cart, you know, but it's good. You can sell it to a foreigner, but you are a holy people to the Lord your God. And then he throws in, as if just an afterthought, and you shall not boil a young goat, goat in its mother's milk. Make sure we got the goat and the milk covered there. Thing. That's interesting to me. When we were in Israel, I told some of you this story. We got into Jerusalem. And Cheryl and I wanted to get lunch. We had a little break there, so we were walking downtown Jerusalem, and, and there was a, a bagel shop right next to um, another shop where they, where they sold shawarma, which was something I really wanted to try. Have you heard of shawarma? It's, it, you may have seen it in some unique places, um, usually like a carnival or that kind of thing, but it's basically a big, a big pole and this big round meat that's on the pole. And it just kind of slowly spins, and they cook the outside of it, and then they shave it off, and they'll put it in a pita bread or that kind of thing. So I'm like, I want to try shawarma. That, that's, that's what I, I want to get. So I went over there, I got that, and Cheryl went next door to the bagel, bagel place. She comes out, I've got my, my shawarma, my, my meat there, I sit down at the table, Cheryl sits right across from me with her bagel and cream cheese, and the guy in the shawarma shop comes running out and says, you can't sit together. I'm like, why? Well, you can't have the cheese and the meat together at the same table. It is not kosher. You can't buy a cheeseburger in Israel. You can't have the meat and the cheese. At breakfast in the morning, they would have milk products and dairy, that kind of thing out, no meat. And if they did have meat out at breakfast, no dairy products. It was one or the other, but you could not have two at the same time. Why? Because legalistically, you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And there's a possibility if you drink milk and eat meat at the same time, it ends up in your st stomach and it boils. And you have just violated the law. How many people want to live by the law? If you live by the law, you're going to die by the law. Bubbly goat meat in your stomach and everything else. So, so it's just interesting. The Lord says, don't do that. Why does he say that? What's that actually about? Well, again, it goes back to paganism. That The idea of boiling a goat in its mother's milk was a pagan ritual. God says, don't be like them. You are not to be like the pagans. I want you to be different. Verse 22, he goes on and says, You shall surely tithe all the produce from what you sow, which comes out of the field every year. You shall eat it in the presence of the Lord your God, at the place where he chooses to establish his name, that is, we talked about last week, Jerusalem, the tithe of your grain, your new wine, your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock, so that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Interesting. How do we learn to fear the Lord? The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So we understand that it's good to fear the Lord. There's a good thing about fearing God. It's not, not being afraid, not cowering. Because through Jesus Christ, we're called to come boldly before the throne of grace. But, but fearing in a godly way. How do you learn to fear the Lord? We see some things here, some very practical ways. I'll give you three quick ones out of these verses. Number one, truly tithe. Truly tithe. He says you shall surely tithe. The, the word there is actually truly. That is tithe, real tithe. <laughs> tithe in real time. It's, it's a real time tithe. It's a true tithe. What does that mean? Gang, it's, it's, the Lord says... In Malachi 3.10, he says, test me. And this is the one time in Scripture he says, test me. See if I won't provide. You give 10% and watch what I do. Watch how I cover you. Watch how I take care of you. A true tithe. What he doesn't say is, figure out how to make it look like 10% and give that. A true tithe is truly, truly tithing. The word tithing, and I've heard people use the word tithing many times as 
as just a kind of a word for giving. Tithing doesn't mean giving. Tithing means 10 percenting. So you can say I gave my tithe to the Lord today if you did. If you didn't, if you gave to the Lord but you didn't give 10%, don't say you tithe because they're two different words. True tithing is truly giving it to the Lord. And Moses says if you truly tithe, you'll learn to fear the Lord. Why? Because you're entrusting to God just 10% of what he's given you. Of what's his in the first place. And it will have an impact on how you fear the Lord. Going on with this thought, not just truly tithing, but truly tithing with hilarious trust. You may have heard this before, but 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 tells us that each month one must do as he purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And the word cheerful is hilaros. In the Greek, it's where we get hilarious. Hilarious givers. I have yet to watch someone go back to the box in the back and just start busting out laughing as they're putting the check in. That'd probably be a little weird. But to give with, with joy, without being under compulsion. But listen, something else about the true tithe. The true tithe would, would truly be 10%. The true tithe also, gang, is not designated or determined by the tither. In other words, my tithe is not my tithe to determine how to spend it. And I've heard people say, and I'm going to give you, this is Rick's opinion on this. I'll give you a couple of my opinions tonight. My opinion, personally, is that tithing is an act of faith, period. It's what I do in faith to the Lord. It's not, it's not an act of charity. It's not part of my giving that I want to make sure I get on my tax return to cover you know, myself there. It's, it's just faith. A tithe I give in faith. Anything else above and beyond that, that's charity. You want to support a child through Compassion International. Terrific. That's charity. That's not tithe. Because you're determining where it goes. And tithing is about faith. Tithing is about saying, I'm hands off on this one, Lord. I'm giving this to you. You determine where it goes. It's releasing yourself from that control issue. And, and, and boy, we're good at it. We're real good at the control issue. I've mentioned before, I have heard people actually threaten to take their tithe somewhere else. And if that ever happens in the bridge, I will show them the door. Because we won't be controlled by someone wanting to control their tithe. The true tithe is not determined by the tither. True, hilarious tithing, gang, it yields a true fear of the Lord. And the third thing to do is taking the tithe to the Lord. Notice again, it goes to the place where he chooses to establish his name. I love that. Verse 23, again he says, you shall eat it, the tithe. You're going to eat it in the presence of the Lord your God. So what God said was, Israel, I want you to bring 10%. Bring it to Jerusalem. When you come to Jerusalem with that tithe, bring it, and then we're going to have a party together. We're going to share it together. We're going to celebrate together. Why did God do this? Because he wanted his people to gather around. He wanted to be with them. He wanted to give them a reason to come before his presence and share and enjoy and celebrate together. And so he said, I want you to bring your tithes to the place of my name, to Jerusalem. Now something else here I think is interesting. If it was impossible to travel, and we saw this last week, if it was impossible to travel with all the flocks and herds and all the stuff, you know, the new wine, the grain, and just load it all up and take it to Jerusalem, Moses says, well, you have an option here. Verse 24, he says, if the distance is so great for you that you're not able to bring the tithe, since the place where the Lord your God chooses to set his name is too far away from you when the Lord your God blesses you, then you shall exchange it for money and bind the money on your hand and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses. Again, that's Jerusalem. And you may spend the money. This is amazing. You can spend the money for whatever your heart desires. For oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink. That's a little surprising. Or whatever your heart desires, but here's the deal. There you shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice, you and your household. So the tithe, God turned around and gave it right back to the people. And the principle is the same today. I'm going to give a true tithe to the Lord. He's going to take care of my needs. I don't have to worry about it. You really believe that, Lord? Yes. But you really believe that, Rick? Yes, I do. Please don't call me Lord. It's a wrong application of my role here. I do believe that. I have seen it work miraculously time and time again. But I also want you to think about something. As we read through this, verse 27, it says, Don't neglect the Levite who is in your town, for he has no portion or inheritance among you. Make sure you take care of them, he says. Verse 28, At the end of every third year, 
You shall also bring out all the tithe of your produce in that year and shall deposit it in your town. Now this is not in lieu of, this is in addition to the normal 10% tithe. Every third year there was an extra tithe. The Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance among you, and the alien and the orphan and the widow who are in your town shall come and eat and be satisfied in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. Every third year a second tithe was added to the tithe that they're already giving. To cover the need of the poor and the fatherless and the widow and the stranger and the Levite in their town in addition to the 10%. In fact, if you take this and compare it or add it up to the regulation on tithing giving in Numbers, Numbers 18, which is the priest portion, Numbers 18, and then Deuteronomy 16, which we'll get to the festival tithes, add that together with the regular 10%, and what you actually come up with for the average person in Israel was an annual tithe, an annual giving required by the Lord of 23%, not 10. Doing all three of these things, it was a 23% deal. And by the way, this was part of how God took care of things, took care of the people, took care of, it was obviously a, a theocracy, God's theocracy in Israel. This is how we're going to provide for everyone and make sure everyone is taken care of. 23%. That's land, crops, livestock, possessions, income of any kind. So if you happen to struggle with just giving 10%, Israelites had to give 23%. You might say, yeah, but, but that was kind of their taxes, wasn't it? And I pay taxes, so I already pay my taxes, so I've got to give an addition of that to the church. I don't understand that. You can make that argument if you want to. However, the second we begin to argue with God over how much we give and percentages, and I already give here, and I already do that, and I do that over here, we leave the place of faith in favor of the bottom line. We stop doing what's about faith, and we start doing what's about practical and possible and doable in my own checking account or budget the Lord says it's your call but I encourage you to act in faith and just trust me trust me with the hilarious tithe in God's economy gang the way to blessing is always found in giving chapter 15 verse 1 at the end of every seven years you shall grant a remission of debts this is a matter of remission. Every creditor shall release what he has loaned to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor and his brother because the Lord's remission has been proclaimed. So every seven years, debt that was owed is released, freed. Now there's some question about this. We do know that every seventh year, this is a sabbatical year, the, the land was given a year of rest, or was supposed to be. Israel never followed this. In fact, it's what landed them in captivity in Babylon. They never followed this, this command of the Lord that every seventh year you let the land lie fallow. You don't uh, seed the land. And so every seventh year they were supposed to do that, but the people themselves, the animals, would also enjoy a year off. Can you even imagine? Every seventh year, nobody works. We just take the year off. We just hang out, have a good time, rest. The land rests, the animals rest, the people rest, and the debt for that year is relieved. Visa, American Express, Discover, MasterCard, they all shut down for the year. <laughs> because they can't, they can't collect. For that year, you're free and clear of it. Now, there's debate about whether the debts were completely canceled out or whether it was just for that year that you had a, a year of basically interest-free no payments for the year. I think I lean toward the second, and that's another opinion of mine. I think it's probably more likely it was, it was after the Sabbath year Every seventh year, they got a year of release, but after that, whatever they owed, they still owed. Okay? Why do I believe that? Because in the 50th year, or the 49th year, 50th year is the year of Jubilee, and in the year of Jubilee, all debts were 100% absolutely canceled at that point. The seventh year pointed to that 50th year when all debts would ultimately be canceled. Well, verse 3 tells us from a foreigner, you may exact it, but your hand shall release whatever of yours is with your brother. So foreigners still had to pay up during that year. Why? Why does the foreigner have to pay? Because the foreigner's not taking the year off. The foreigner's still working. The foreigner's still making money, and his land wasn't lying fallow, nor was his income suspended. So the foreigner still was taking it in, and so the Lord said, you can still take it in from the foreigner as well. But not from your brother, because during that year your brother's not working. Neither are you. You've taken the year off. 
verse 4 going on. However, there will be, watch this, no poor among you, since the Lord will surely bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess. If you listen, if only you listen obediently to the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all this commandment which I am commanding you today. Now listen, don't miss this. Because we have here in these verses God's plan for the absolute eradication of poverty in the world. People say, wouldn't it be great if we could just get rid of poverty? Wouldn't that be awesome? God had a plan for it. He gave it to Israel. And the plan was such that, in God's own words, if you listen obediently, there will be no poor among you. If you do this, if you follow what I'm prescribing for you, nobody's going to be poor. Everybody will be taken care of. What, what do we do here? Tithe every third year, God says, to the poor, chapter 14. Release every man from his debt every seventh year, chapter 15. God's saying, if you will trust me and do things my way, I will release you from poverty. There will be no poverty in the world if you do things my way. Why is there poverty in the world today and why is it so intense? Because we don't trust the Lord. Because we're too greedy. We won't take the year off. We don't listen to his precepts and his commandments. And so we have poverty. God's plan has always been about generosity and mercy and forgiveness. And through these things, no one has to be poor. But we are poor. And by the way, Israel always had poverty, without exception. And they never once even celebrated the year of Jubilee. Not one time in their history. We have no record of it. That year when everybody's debt was canceled, when everything that was owned by others and lost went back to the original owner, everybody's free and clear. They never celebrated or practiced that a single time. Had they? Well... They wouldn't have had the poverty that they had, and even today have. Why didn't they do it? Well, think about it. From a human perspective, it doesn't make logical sense. I'm just going to let my land lie there for a year, unused? Now, in their day, they couldn't have known that the nutrients in the soil needed rest to rejuvenate. Like we know out in the Skagit Valley now, you'll watch one year, there's all kinds of beautiful tulips on the side of the road, the next year it's dirt, and you're like, what happened to the tulips? So let the land rest to rejuvenate so it can produce more the next year. The Israelites didn't know that. God knew it. But it didn't make sense to them. Let me say this. God's financial pro uh, principles don't make sense to us either. Tithing doesn't make sense. It doesn't work out real well on paper. But it's God's plan. And it works. Well, verse 6 reading on. As the Lord your God, for the Lord your God will bless you just as he promised you, and you will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow. And you will rule over many nations, but they will not rule over you. Of course, this is if they will listen to the Lord obediently, which they didn't. Verse 7, if there's a poor man with you, one of your brothers, in any of your towns in the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart, nor close your hand from your poor brother. But you shall freely open your hand to him, and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need in whatever he lacks. Beware that there is no base thought in your heart, saying, Hmm, the seventh year, the year of remission is near, and your eye is hostile toward your poor brother, and you give him nothing, then he may cry to the Lord against you, and it will be, he says, a sin to you. You shall generously give to him. And your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him, because for this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all your undertakings. For the poor will never cease to be with you in the land. Therefore I command you, saying, you shall freely open your hand to your brother, to your needy and poor in your land. Wait a minute. Didn't God just say there will be no poor among you back in verse 4? And now in verse 11 he's saying, for you will always have, the poor will never cease to be in the land. So wait, they'll never cease to be, but over here he says there will be no poor among you. Is he contradicting himself? No, he's saying this is the reality. The poor will never cease to be among you. God already knows this. Uh, of course, if you do what I tell you to do, there will be no poor among you, but I know you're not going to do what I'm telling you to do. So the reality is there will always be poor among you. Jesus even said that. Jesus comes along in John 12, 8, he says, For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Interesting verse, because he's applying that to a specific situation. 
and yet it has such application to us, doesn't it? You always have the poor among you. You don't always have me. I think in our lives, if we have Jesus among us, there should be no poor among us. Because we're taking care of each other. You look at the first century church in the book of Acts. What did they do? Man, they sold property and houses and they just dumped it all together and said, Hey, whoever has a need, here's the, here's the kitty. Here's the pot. You just take what you need. We're going to cover it because we love each other and there shouldn't be any poor among us. And Jesus is here. And when Jesus is here, there's no poor. But when we don't have Jesus with us, the poor are among us. 1,500 years after Moses writes, Jesus arrived and there were still poor people in Israel just as God said there would be because God knows the heart of man. By the way, another principle that doesn't make sense to our business minds, verse 9 Verse 9 going back says, Beware that you don't say this in the seventh year. The year of remission is near. Hmm. I'm close to that year where i got to relieve debt, so I better not loan anything this year. Mm-hmm. God already knows the heart. He knows exactly where men are going to go. I won't lend during the sixth year. I'll take a year to start earning interest. And if I'm coming close to the Jubilee, I might never get it back. Close to that 50th year. So you can imagine, 50 years away from the Jubilee. And by the way, the Jewish people did this. In the first or second year, approaching that jubilee, well, at that time, all kinds of interest. You know, all kinds of giving and and, and sharing, but the closer the jubilee they got, the more skittish they got. Of course, as we said, they never celebrated that jubilee. But God says, and here's a business principle, if you're generous in business and among people, God will be generous to you. He'll take care of the difference. He'll make up for it. He'll get you there. You focus yourself on taking care of others. Well, verse 12. If your kinsman, and we read this Sunday, we're going to come back to this on Sunday again, but if your kinsman, a Hebrew man or woman, is sold to you, he shall serve six years, but in the seventh year you shall set him, set him free. And, and Pat, you said you were six years at the Boys and Girls Club in Anacortes, right? Seventh year is coming, my friend. You should be set free. And when you set him free, you shall not send him away empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally from your flock and from your threshing floor and from your wine vat. You shall give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. Now, verses 12 through 18, again, they're all about the bond slave. We're going to go back and look at that again on Sunday. And verse 17 describes the piercing of the ear of the servant who wants to stay in the master's household. We talked about that last week. But for all of us who would be bond servants who would like to be, who aspire to that lowly position before the Lord, that humble place, all who truly desire this highest calling of the Christ follower, take note of this interesting statement. The Lord says, You shall furnish liberally from your flock, from your threshing floor, verse 14, from your wine vat, you shall give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. He's speaking to the master here, and here's the deal. The master always takes care of his bondservants. The master will take care of the bondservant. The master will provide for the need of the bondservant. The master is to do that, and God is not telling this master to do anything that he doesn't do in our lives. The master takes care of his servants. It's a command of the Lord to the owner of the servants, specifically Hebrew servants, to take care of them. I mentioned before, I, I'm so impressed with uh, Papa Murphy's, with Jeff and Penelope's Papa Murphy's in, in Anacortes. My son Corey just got a job there, 16 years old, and he's great. He's talking pizza all the time. It's, it's interesting. He just he loves the job. But Jeff and Penelope, and I'm just going to boast on them for a second here, because I can. They, if, if I was a teenager and I was looking for a fast food job, that would be the place to work. They take their employees out every year for an employee, employee appreciation dinner completely paid for by the business. Every Christmas, they have a Christmas party that I drool over. The kids get gifts. They, they do this thing all year long. And this thing is so cool. They have candy and, and chips and soda and stuff in the back. And, and the, the workers there can buy them. You can buy a bag of chips if you want, and on your break or whatever. And all the money, it doesn't go to pay back the purchase of all that candy and chips. It goes into a pot that they keep all year long, and at Christmas time, whatever's there, they use for presents for their employees at their Christmas party. Kids walk out of there with iPods and with little portable DVD players. And whenever Corey gets this year, there's going to be a dad tax on it. <laughs> He's bringing it home to me. 
But that's the, that's the mentality that God says you need to have toward your bond servants, Israelites. Why? Because that's the mentality that God has for us. The Lord would say, hey, go ahead and, and go as far as you can for me. Be a bond servant. Be an absolute slave before me. Because you know what? I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to provide for you. And you might not always see it in tangible, physical ways on this life. But man, there are going to be some people walking around with some heavy-duty crowns in heaven. Bejeweled and shining, pure gold. Huge crowns that, that show the, the act of service and love, the love they have for the Lord. And I, I've shared this before, but you might say, well, yeah, my humility, I don't want to have a big crown, just a little one. You know, I don't want to be one of those things that's real obvious how big a crown. No, you want the biggest crown you can get. Why? Because that you're going to act, it's going to be your act of worship in heaven. The bigger your crown, the larger crown you're going to have to throw before the Lord in worship. So go for the big crown. Pursue bond service. We'll talk more about that on Sunday. But Jesus puts an interesting point on this whole thing for you and for me. Matthew twenty four forty five. he says, Who then is the faithful and sensible slave, bond servant, whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. The bond servant is under the charge of the master, but he's also given charge of the master's household, charged to care for the other bond slaves and servants. And Jesus says, oh, that slave, that slave who is loving the master's household, the church, who's caring for the other servants, when Jesus comes, when he finds you in that business of caring for others, you will be blessed. You'll be blessed. That's the kind of bond servant God is looking for. Verse 18, it goes on and says, It shall not seem hard to you when you set him free. For he has given you six years with double the service of a higher man, so the Lord your God will bless you in whatever you do. And there's something in this, I think, for you and me, in our love for each other. James says in James chapter 2, verse 15, If a brother or a sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to him, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, and yet you don't give them what's necessary for their body, what use is that? My friends and I used to do this in college. We thought this verse was kind of humorous, and so anytime we left each other on campus, we'd say, Hey, go in peace, be warmed and filled. And of course, we wouldn't give each other anything. But that was the point. Don't, don't say, hey, go be taken care of. God bless you. But then turn a blind eye to the need that's there. There's a lot of needs in this body, by the way. We're just praying about it this morning in staff need, in staff meeting. A lot of needs. A lot of things going on where people are hurting and, and need help. And one of the biggest challenges for Christians, and I've really been called to the carpet on this in my own heart recently, we have a tendency because we want to be Christ-like and we want to be compassionate. We want to be giving and caring. We have a tendency to say to people, I'm going to help you out with that. We're real good at saying, hey, I want to be there for you. But when push comes to shove and when the time comes to deliver, oh, I just don't have time to get to that right now. And it's witness. It's testimony. Are we living like Jesus and loving like Jesus? James said, hey, faith with... Outworks is dead, being by itself. Don't say you believe in Jesus. Don't say you're a servant of Jesus Christ. If you don't have faith. Your faith is going to be active. Verse 19. You shall consecrate to the Lord your God all the firstborn males that are born of your herd and of your flock. You shall not work with the firstborn of your herd, you sh nor shear the firstborn of your flock. You and your household shall eat it every year before the Lord your God in the place which the Lord your God chooses. But if it has any defect such as lameness or blindness or any serious defect, you shall not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. You shall eat it within your gates. The clean and the, and the unclean and the clean alike may eat it as a gazelle or a deer, only you shall not eat its blood. You are to pour it on the ground like water and quickly gain. What is that all about? It's about Jesus. The whole thing that we just read, the firstborn, Firstborn, without defect, whose blood is poured on the ground. This is a picture of Jesus Christ. It's why it was important to God in the very beginning. It points that, to that the perfect, flawless, firstborn Son of God. His blood poured out on the ground at Calvary. And I want to I mention something to you here because we've been talking about cults and, and things quite a bit lately. Something Jehovah's Witness will point out to you if you're talking to them is that Jesus is called the firstborn. 
Because in Jehovah's Witness belief, Jesus is a created being. Created before other, the rest of creation, but created nonetheless. That he's not truly God eternal, but he's created. Let me give you some things on this. In the Bible, it does say that he's firstborn. Colossians 1.15, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, a couple of things just to note and be aware of on this. Let me take this little rabbit trail for just a second here. The Greek word for firstborn is prototokos. If it were first created, the word would be prototixis. It's a different word. Firstborn does not mean first created. It doesn't mean created at all. It means firstborn, literally, the first one born. And it means firstborn status. Like the firstborn of the household, the the, the heir to the household. But some things to note on this, regarding Christ's firstborn status, number one, it implies his priority over creation. Not just preceding creation, but his priority over it. But he has priority over all created things. He perceives every created thing because he's God. It implies his priority over creation. It indicates his sovereignty over creation. That he is above all created things. He reigns supreme. It also identifies his delivery into creation. And this is important. Christ as the firstborn son of God. He is the first and only God-man. The only begotten Son of God, the firstborn of God, born of woman, but seated by the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 1 verse 35 says, The angel said to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. He was born, firstborn of God, born of woman, the human side, born of the Holy Spirit. God in the flesh. Isaiah 7:14 then tells us, Therefore the Lord will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and will bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. So it implies his firstborn status, his priority, his sovereignty, his delivery. It also informs us of his superiority. That before him none other was resurrected to live eternally. He is superior because... When he was resurrected, he became the firstborn of the dead, Revelation 1.5 tells us. And finally, it identifies his role in the triunity. His role in the triunity, which is beyond creation. The triune nature that we've talked about a lot recently. The Father, God. The Son, God. The Holy Spirit, God. All three, God. And in clear, understandable language, Jesus Christ is the firstborn. The firstborn who has no defect, no lameness, no blindness. But he was sacrificed and his blood poured out for us. When Jesus Christ came the first time, gang, he set aside his divinity, becoming heir apparent to the throne. Setting aside his godly mantle for an earth suit and a human relationship to God to explain himself to us. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and he, Jesus, upholds all things by the word of his power. Jesus Christ, the firstborn. And I'll tell you what, when he comes again, his mantle of divinity restored, it will be as not heir apparent to the throne, but heir confirmed to the throne, King of kings, Lord of lords, name above all names, Jesus Christ, the firstborn over all creation. Now, hold on to your seats, or maybe fasten your seat belts. We're going to fly through chapter 16. I want to show you something, and we'll be done tonight. Chapter 16 discusses three of the seven major feasts of Israel. If you want to study the seven major feasts, last December, we went through each one, one at a time, feast by feast, and we have them on CD, and you can study those. To me, it was a fascinating study. I I loved looking into that and learning, seeing Jesus in these feasts. But Moses here in chapter 15 discusses three of them. These are the three big ones, the three major feasts of the seven, three times a year, three convocations where God required all male Israelites to come to the place where God's name would be established, Jerusalem. Each of these feasts, along with all the others, do two specific things. Two things they do 
They commemorate and they anticipate. Every one of the major feasts of Israel commemorate or anticipate in their very nature. Here are the three feasts. The first one is the Pesach. Pesach, in the Hebrew, it's Passover. Verse 1, in the month of Abib, celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God, for in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. And I'll mention to you, Abib is the same month as Nisan. Nisan today is the month of the Passover. Nisan is mentioned later in the scriptures, approaching or after the Babylonian captivity. Why? Because Nisan is a Babylonian month. The Jewish calendar today, all the names on the Jewish calendar come out of their captivity in Babylon. It's a Babylonian calendar that the Jews use today. It even has a month in it called Tammuz. And Tammuz, I don't have time to get into right now, but Tammuz is a Babylonian little mini-god. Okay? So Abib is the original Phoenician month that this happened. Nisan is the later month after Babylonian captivity, same month. Okay? Verse 2, you shall sacrifice the Passover to the Lord your God from the flock, from the herd, in the place where the Lord chooses to establish his name. During this time, it says, you shall not eat leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat with it unleavened bread, the bread of affliction. And this is now another feast, but he doesn't specifically call it out, the feast of unleavened bread. So that you may remember all the days of your life, the day when you came out of the land of Egypt. Seven days no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory, and none of the flesh which you sacrifice on the evening of the first day shall remain overnight until morning. You're not allowed to sacrifice the Passover in any of your towns which the Lord your God is giving you, but at the place where the Lord your God chooses to establish his name, you shall sacrifice the Passover in the evening at sunset, at the time you came out of Egypt, which was the 14th of the month of Abib, which was the day that Jesus was crucified. Passover. You shall cook and eat it in the place which the Lord your God chooses. In the morning you are to return to your tents. Six days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the seventh day there shall be a solemn assembly to the Lord your God and shall do no work on it. Passover. Passover did two things. It commemorated and it anticipated. It commemorated the night the Lord brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and saved them from their slavery. But it anticipated the night Jesus Christ became our Passover. Commemoration, anticipation. That's Passover. The second feast mentioned here is Shavuot. Shavuot is the Feast of Weeks, what you and I would call Pentecost. Interesting verse 9 reading on, you shall count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain. And then you shall celebrate the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, Pentecost. To the Lord your God with a tribute of a free will offering of your hand, which you shall give just as the Lord your God blesses you. Oh, you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. You and your son and your daughter and your male and female servants, the Levites who's in your town, and the stranger and the orphan and the widow who are in your midst, in the place where the Lord your God chooses to establish his name, you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. So Passover and now Shavuot. What does Shavuot commemorate? It commemorated for the Jewish people looking back the latter rains and the spring harvest. It also came to, by the way, over time and tradition, Shavuot began, came to commemorate the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. Jews today, if they talk about Shavuot or discuss it at all, they look back to the tradition of when God gave the law on Mount Sinai, but it anticipates something much greater. Not the giving of the law on Sinai, but the giving of the Holy Spirit on Mount, si on Mount Zion. That's what it anticipated. Commemorating the latter rains, the spring harvest, the giving of the law, Shavuot anticipates the giving of the Holy Spirit on Mount Zion. Third and final feast here, Sukkot. Sukkot is the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, verse 13. Moses says, You shall celebrate the Feast of Booths seven days after you have gathered in from your threshing floor and your wine vat. And you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter and your male and female servant and the Levite and the stranger and the orphan and the widow who are in your towns. Seven days you shall celebrate a feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses, because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands, so that you will be altogether joyful. What he's talking about here, this feast, Sukkot, Sukkot is mentioned more than any other feast in all scripture. It's mentioned more times. It has the greatest amount of focus. I would have thought it was Passover or maybe Rosh Hashanah. 
or Yom Kippur Day of Atonement yeah that's the one that should be mentioned more often but it's not it's this one the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles it commemorated them living 40 years in tents in the wilderness and the way they do it they would practice it across history was they come into Jerusalem and even today will celebrate Sukkot and they make little tents for themselves out of palm fronds and they'd build these things up and they'd be able to see the sky the stars through the ceiling at night and they would dwell in these little dwellings these, these tents for seven days as a reminder to commemorate 40 years spent wandering in the desert in the wilderness that's the commemoration but the anticipation is awesome because it anticipates a time to come in Israel's story that has yet to be in fact it anticipates a time to come that we haven't experienced ourselves Zechariah 14.16 says it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went up against Jerusalem will go up year to year to worship the king the Lord of hosts and to celebrate the feast of booths it's reinstated when? in the time of the millennial kingdom and so the feast of booths it anticipates that coming millennium that thousand year reign of Christ and Amos chapter 9 verse 11 says in that day I will raise up the fallen booth of David and wall up its breaches and I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old behold days are coming declares the Lord when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows the seed in other words the things are going to be growing so fast and so wonderfully that we can't even get them picked off the vine before we're already coming back for more it's incredible and he says when the mountains will drip sweet wine and all the hills will be dissolved that wonderful time of the millennial kingdom anticipated in Sukkot and verse 16 says three times in a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses at the feast of unleavened bread or Passover at the feast of weeks and at the feast of booths and listen to this final thing don't miss this we're going to stop here they shall not appear before the Lord empty handed you're going to come up three times a year Israel and we're going to celebrate we're going to party together we're going to enjoy each other and you're going to be in praise to the Lord your God but don't come empty handed don't show up waiting to receive you come bringing you come bringing every year these three things were absolutely required of all the men now women and children were invited as well but God specifically calls out the men it would be really cool you can see a bumper sticker on the back of a camel and it just says real men worship in Jerusalem because that's what God wanted you want to be a real man you be a man of worship you be a man who shows up when God calls the Lord's plan in the roles that he gives us the women are going to show up ladies you have a tendency to show up to be interested in and desirous of spiritual things we men tend to reside more in the place of the soul rather than the spirit the place of the getting it done the place of, of the mind the place of the work all the women are saying honey let's go to church and we're going I've been working all week <laughs> and the Lord says real men come up to Jerusalem I know the women are going to get there and if the women get there the kids are going to get there but the men don't stay home three times a year you come up and verse 17 says every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God which he has given you when you come don't come empty handed and you know I realize this I am totally preaching to the choir here but I'm going to say it anyway when we come to worship do we come to bring a blessing or do we come to receive a blessing do I come with expectation or do I come with offering when you're rousing yourself on a Sunday morning for example and you're getting ready to come and worship the Lord what are you thinking about are you thinking about what you're going to go get or are you considering are you praying about Lord how can you use me to bless somebody else this morning what is it that I can bring to my fellowship today how can I show up not to be served but as Jesus says to serve far too many Christians show up empty handed and we're not talking dollars here but we are talking about something that makes sense 
little pun there for you. If you come to worship the Lord empty-handed, you will most likely leave empty-handed. But if you come to give praise, to give tithes, to give a kind word, to give to others, to literally give up, you will find yourself blessed to overflowing. And that's why Jesus says, now reread it, Matthew 24, 45, who is the faithful and sensible slave who his master put in charge of his household to give him their food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. The slave that we talked about Sunday, who loves the master, and he loves the master's household, the church, and he loves serving in the household. That slave, that bond servant, never comes empty-handed. He always comes with what he knows the others need. He always comes to serve, to be used of the Lord, and that's what God calls for us to do. And when we show up, men, when you come to Jerusalem those three times a year, don't come in empty-handed. Brothers and sisters... May we be among those who do not come to be served, but come to serve. Now we're going to stop here tonight. We'll pick up in verse 18 next week. But I've been doing a lot of thinking about this whole prospect of of deacons and of servants. And what that's going to mean and what it should look like biblically for the Bridge Christian Fellowship. But it's interesting to me because I began this process, and Larry and I were talking about this on Sunday. I began this process looking at diakonos, deacons. I found myself spending more time looking at the Greek word doulos, which is bondservant. Doulos is deeper. I've got to not get too far ahead of myself because I'm going to share all this on Sunday. But there's deacon, the role of servant, called to tasks, called to needs, and there are a lot of needs at the bridge that need to be taken care of. And, and, and specific qualifications even that Paul gives for diakonos. But then we begin to see Paul and James and Jude and, and John and Peter referring them to themselves as doulos. Not diakonos. Doulos. Bondservant. Absolute, abject slave. And I'm looking at these two and I'm going, this is needed. This is where we all are called to be. And my question for you tonight, in the coming with something in your hands, is where are you going to fall? On God's amazing chart, He's got this, you know, these standards. Saved Christian, great. Diakonos, a role that, that you can provide for the fellowship, wonderful. Bondservant. Are you among those, and they are few, who may be called to be a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm asking the Lord to explain this more to me. I hope I can explain it more to you on Sunday. But Father, we pray that you will lead us to that place. Jesus, you said to Peter that a time would be coming in his life when he would stretch out his hands and he would literally Jesus you said he was going to die in a way that he didn't know that he was going to die you described for him a way that he was going to go out and Peter did he went out a bond servant Jesus I don't know that I've ever been more serious about any prayer in my life but when I pray that you make me a bond servant I'm serious, Lord. We ask that you show us what it means to come with our hands full of blessing and offering to you, Lord, and to your household. I pray, Lord, that we might know the wonder and the blessing of being bond servants and discovering in our lives a, a humbleness and a place before you where we are so so low before you that we can but grasp your feet in worship and adoration slaves, bond servants and I pray over my brothers and sisters tonight myself included Lord, may you find us doing so when you come thank you Lord In Jesus' name, amen.